Before the video starts, do me a favor. At the end of the video, there's a couple little outtakes. Check them out, okay? When I'm editing these videos, there's a crap ton of crutch words that I have to take out. All right, okay. Yeah, just, it's funny. I try not to say them, but I say them all the time. So check out the end of the video, you'll see. Also, if you guys are interested in supporting the channel, we just got a restock of a bunch of different stuff. The hats are the number one sellers. Beanies, we have cuffed beanies. We have non-cuffed beanies. We have uh, multiple different designs on the hats. You have the dad hats for the bald guys that have really short foreheads. That doesn't apply to me because my forehead is huge. We have the flat bill hats. This is a um, snapback hat, but it's also flex fit. Okay, all of my hats have a black underbill. That's really important for me because when you're working, there's nothing worse than having the, the gray or the white underbill and your fingerprints get all over it. And then the most popular hat is the... Uh, this one is a breathable material, but it's not a trucker hat. It's hard to explain, but I can see light through it. It's a flex fit, black underbill, and just a standard bill on the front. Just says HVACR. If you're interested, check it out on my website, hvacrvideos.com. Let's get on with the video. This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. Well, guess what? I am back. This is the one that... Uh, we had plugged up filters on, two bad compressors, and uh, when I changed the compressor, there was no oil in the compressor, the old one that I autopsied, oh boy. But guess what, I'm not back here for this one. I'm back here for their bar AC, okay? So this is their kitchen AC. This right here is their dining room AC. And the bar AC is actually over here. This one right here. But guess what? They said it keeps tripping the main circuit breaker. I walked in the door and I saw that it was in the tripped position. So yeah, um, we uh, I don't doubt that the filters on this unit are gonna be plugged solid. We just had a tropical storm come through about a week and a half, two weeks ago, probably two weeks ago now. And I was like, why aren't they calling me? Because I know that this whole Coachella Valley, which I have to say right now, I do not live in the Coachella Valley. This is not my normal service area. I come out here for a few specific customers and that's it. I'm two hours away with my normal service area, okay? Because I get emails and comments and stuff all the time. I don't live out here. I don't work out here on the regular. Just service a few customers out in this area. But the entire Coachella Valley got destroyed from this tropical storm. Um, massive flooding, sandstorms, craziness, right? The res resin or remnants. Looks like... I think I cleaned most of this up last time. You can still see the drains are all just discombobulated. Don't know why, whatever. That's a whole nother problem for another day. But this AC is tripping the breaker. So let's get my tools out and we're gonna figure out all why. Right, I opened up the electrical section and right off the bat, this is what I see right here. That's not good. So if that continued to run like that, this is a three phase compressor it would have eventually single phased because it's three phase and it's running off of two phases when a wire burns off. But we don't know if that's the only problem. So let's, uh, contactor looks to be stuck in the mid position. So I do have power turned off at the breaker downstairs. We're going to turn off power right here and we are going to start testing for continuity to ground to see what is potentially shorted. Look at these compressors, just like on the other unit, you can see that they've been flooding back for a significant amount of time. You can see that they're almost calcified, like, so yeah, it's not gonna be good. Before I go any further, I also brought filters, air filters out with me because I knew these were gonna be plugged up and they are completely set or just completely impacted with sand. So I'm actually gonna change all the air filters first on all the ACs before they start getting customers in the building. Hey, right, got new filters in every AC, dated. The last ones were from two months ago and they were just hammered. Now this customer does do routine maintenance quarterly, so their maintenance is about due, but filters just plug up because of all these sandstorms they have. I mean, we cleaned this unit out two months ago. Look at that. As best as we could, we cleaned it out. So the customer knows that Whenever we change the filters, I can't get all the sand out of there. It's gonna freaking blast downstairs, so they're privy to that. Um, pulley has some slight wear to it, but it's not bad, so I think we're good on that. 
I'm gonna put all the panels back on and we're gonna finish our troubleshooting. So starting with the compressor that had the burnt wire, I've got my meter on continuity, the tone feature, okay? And we've got one leg clamp to ground and we are testing from one terminal and we have a direct short to ground. That means there's an electrical path from the electrical wiring in this compressor to the copper lines, which is grounding the unit out. This is a grounded compressor that has burnt the refrigerant. Now, I know it's gonna be a severe burn because the customer told me that every time they trip or reset the breaker, it trips again. So they've been tripping it for a while, causing those things to constantly short, constantly short, constantly short, and it just destroys the inside of that compressor. All right, so we know this one's dead. I'm gonna go ahead and isolate this, tape it off, pull all the wires off the bottom of the contactor, and then we'll move on and check the rest of them. So what I did was I removed all the wires, okay? They're basically right here. I pulled them all the way back to this spot right here, pulled the wires out, and uh, just took them out of the picture. That way nobody can mess with them. So there's no power going to the top or the bottom of that contactor besides control voltage, of which I'll disconnect the control voltage too because we might blow a low voltage transformer if it won't pull in or something. Um, this guy's disconnected. This compressor's bad, uh, 61,000 BTUs. So this one right here and this one right here, we need to test. So first and foremost, okay, we're getting continuity to ground. So I've confirmed my ground is a good source. So now I'm going from each compressor lead to ground on the remaining two compressors and we're getting nothing. And then I go to this right here, testing from this to ground, seeing if there's any other shorts anywhere else. And there's nothing. I've got no more shorts to ground don't see any other problems as of yet. So what I'm gonna do is uh, we're gonna go downstairs and turn the main breaker on, then we're gonna come up here and check power at the disconnect switch. I'm gonna bring my air blower up and I'm gonna blow this electrical section out real quick. And then we're gonna attempt to start this guy up and see if we can get the remaining two compressors operating for now. I went and grabbed a face mask for this one because it's gonna be nasty. This sand out here is not, not that any sand's really healthy, but this stuff's not healthy because a lot of it can come from uh, the evaporating water in the Salton Sea. And uh, there's a lot of toxic chemicals in there because of agricultural runoff and stuff. And so there's been lots of cancers and different things linked to the blowing dust from the Salton Sea. So whenever you can, you wanna mask up. We got our main disconnect switch right here. Let's see what we got going on as far as electrical. All right, one to two to 11. Two to three to 11. And then let's get one to three to 12. So we have three phase power coming into this disconnect switch. One, two, three, please don't blow up. VFD has power, standing to the side, it's ramping up. So indoor blower motor's running. So far we got LEDs on on the little second two stage board. Let's hear these compressors start up and see what happens when they start up. Both compressors turned on at the same time. They really should stage those. Looks like we got some sort of short cycle there. I don't know what that was about. I better gauge up on this guy. You saw how they like turned off both of them then turned back on. This thing only has free stats and high pressure controls. It doesn't have low pressure controls, so maybe it went off on high head. Better uh, hop up here and see if the condenser fan motors are working. All three condenser fan motors are working, so that's a good sign. Condenser is kind of dirty. I'm gonna give it a, a, I'm gonna take the air blower to it. I was gonna say the wrong phrase, but I'm gonna take the air blower to it. You guys can figure out what I was gonna say and then I held myself off on it. Let's see what this does. Woo! Cleaning a condenser coil with a leaf blower. 
to that all into the street. All right, I'm currently probing up on the system and I've talked about this before, but when you are using digital tools, whether it be probes or digital manifold, I don't care what brand it is, even analog tools like a compound gauge manifold, you always wanna make sure that your stuff is zeroed out. If you look right here, this high pressure probe says negative 1.5 PSI. Now that may, nice, may not seem like a lot, but when you're calculating different things, you don't want something right there like that, negative 1.5 PSI when it's not connected to anything, throwing you off when you're trying to dial in a critical charge on something. So you always wanna make sure that your tools are zeroed out. Now, we can have a conversation about how over time these things start to drift and they constantly, I have some that don't drift at all and then some that do. So honestly, I have so many of them, it's kind of hard to keep track of which ones are doing it. I guess I should start marking them so I can take them in and get them replaced or something. But always wanna make sure you're checking that before you uh, apply your gauges to things. That's why it's so important to not put your gauges on before you turn everything on and zero all your probes out. All right, now this guy's been running for a little bit while I've been putting on the probes and everything. Circuit one, as far as normal system vitals, superheat doesn't look bad. Let's see, it's a fixed orifice metering device. We're calling for five degrees of superheat. Currently right now we have eight, eh, that's fine. Subcooling is, I'm not too concerned with that. Let's go ahead and change over to the second stage. Second stage, there we go. We've got three degrees superheat and 10 degrees subcooling, four degrees super. It's kind of ranging as it's bringing the building temperature down, okay? Now, even though this has three circuits, we know the third stage is bad, so I have it profiled as just a 12 ton, two six ton compressors. We have three six ton compressors, basically. So this should be an 18 ton, um, yeah, 18 ton. So 210,000 BTUs on the model number. So they do some weird stuff with the compressors though, because they put, 61,000 BTU compressors, but it's something they do with the condenser and evaporator size and that gets them to the full 18 tons. Um, okay, so approach temperature, I mean, I don't see anything crazy with that. Temperature split across the unit is, you know, eight, nine degrees. It's gonna be that way because um, we're missing a compressor, right? So not gonna get much more on that. Uh, delivered capacity seems like it's out of whack on that one. But I think it's gonna be because right now we're running with massively high airflow, but we're only using two of the compressors. So, yeah, I mean, these things are doing everything that they can, you know? Being this guy being down, all the condenser fan motors are running. But yeah, see like the VFD, you guys can't see it, but it says 60 Hertz. It's programmed for 60 Hertz. Really, it should be running at lower speed. Um, I can actually probably get it to run at lower speed and get a better temperature differential if I disconnect Y2, which I'm gonna try that and see if that'll, it, it should slow down the blower. Doing that did slow down the blower. Uh, it also dropped my superheat, which is expected. So it's currently at two degrees on the first stage. We'll give it some time and two degrees on the second stage. Um, temperature split went up because we're moving the air slower through the evaporator coil. So that's actually good. Whether or not I'm gonna leave it this way, we'll have to see. Um, I mean, it's doing everything that it can. These other two compressors are working. Uh, we slowed down to 40 Hertz. I just taped off the Y2 wire because the Y2 just controls that third stage anyways. Um, hmm. Okay, well, I'm gonna let this run for a little bit. I'm gonna test the crankcase heaters, make sure those are working and just kind of go through everything on this All guy. Right, at this point, this thing's doing everything they can. I'm going to, uh, it's got a really low load inside the building right now because I'm really, you know, ramping them down. So um, we're going to uh, give them a quote to replace this compressor right here. Um, it's gonna be a fun chore. Yeah, it's gonna be a nasty one. Not a lot of room now that they have three dryers. The last unit had two seven and a half ton compressors. This one has uh, three six tons. So it's kind of crammed in there, but we'll figure it out. And that's it. Um, everything else seems to be working. So we'll just tell the customer to keep an eye on it until they approve this quote. And we are back today. So we are gonna go ahead and replace this compressor right here. So it's a process. You can see we don't have power up here. So made our own cheater cord. Um, recover the charge, change the dryer. 
you know the drill. Let's get to it. This restaurant's just horrendous. We pulled this out real quick. These were just changed. Like, you wonder why compressors are going bad in these things. That's insane. We've got the gas recovered out of this guy. It's now open to atmosphere. Um, we're gonna get the compressor pulled out. We gotta put a new dryer. We're gonna do the ball valve thing with the big 30 cubic inch dryer. But what we are gonna do on this one, because of the problem I ran into on the last one, is we are gonna slightly pressurize this with nitro. Um, it is a burn, right? So it's grounded. So I got a new piston just in case. We're gonna pull the chat lift connection, make sure the piston's not plugged. We'll probably just swap it out. But we're also gonna drill this suction line right in the bottom and we're gonna pressurize it slightly to see if we can push any oil out because I suspect that the compressor's oil is all stuck in the evaporator. That's my assumption. We'll definitely blow the condenser out too. It is a bit scary doing this, but just going slow. Trying to make sure the shavings all fall out. Okay, hopes that there's no other shavings going in. Well, there's no oil dripping out as it is, but once we get some nitrogen in here, we'll hope that we'll blood back blow from the liquid line over so that way potentially it blows it this way. That's the idea. The idea here is that we're gonna take nitrogen, slightly pressurize the liquid line. We still have everything else capped. And because I drilled the bottom of this right here, in theory, if there is oil in there, slight pressure should start to push it out of that hole. That's the idea. So that's what we're gonna try right now. Go ahead. So far, nothing. Okay, well, maybe we don't have an oil log evap, and I don't even hear it either. Interesting. Normally you can hear it slurping around in there, and I'm not hearing anything. All right, well, we know that that's probably not our problem, so that's a good sign. It could be in the condenser though too, so we'll definitely have to back blow that way. Went ahead and sanded this up. We got Will over here taking the compressor out right now. I'll go ahead and get this uh, chat lift connector right here pulled off and we'll have a look at the inside of that piston. Uh, I did get a little bit of nastiness blowing out in there, just a little bit. So we do know this is a ground for sure. So, but yeah, I didn't even hear like oil slurping around with the air. So that's kind of a good sign, I guess. Now this is all just precautionary because we had a grounded compressor. I decided to pull the piston too. Okay. The piston doesn't look bad, but we're going to change it. We have a new one. It's not a big deal at all. So We've got a new connector and everything. So we're gonna grab this little guy right here, get in there. It's a little wire, piano wire thing. We'll pull it out and slap the new one in and put the new uh, Teflon ring in there too. Pulled the old piston out, nothing too crazy, just a little dirty. But again, it's cheap insurance on something like this. So we got a new Teflon ring in there. We're gonna put a little bit of this Nylog blue on there, just right on the Teflon ring. So I'll put a little bit on there and then just a little bit on the chat lift connection right up here in the top so that way it can spin really well from past experience the last compressor we did on that unit over there remember it had no oil in it so as we're unsweating things we're watching for flame outs because flame outs are an indication of trapped oil so when we popped the dryer we were just kind of watching but we didn't see any signs of it so far i don't doubt that there's gonna be a little bit of oil right here that's pretty normal um a lot of people say like, oh my gosh, that's a trap that should never be there. No, I mean, the, the concept of a trap is that it speeds up refrigerant velocity. So this little in or trap right here actually just speeds up the refrigerant velocity. Yeah, there's gonna be a little bit of oil sitting in there typically, but it's gonna help to speed it up and grab oil from the system. So um, yeah, we're gonna get that dryer pulled out and then we got the one we're putting in is massively oversized because this is a burnout. So Will came over here and patched this one up. So we're good on that, that should be good. And then uh, we were trying to remove the filter dryer over here, but the top of the thing kept burning. So we got the Viper heat blanket in there now to try to protect everything. So that way he could really get in there and pull that dryer out. Still got a little bit on the back of the unit, but the heat blanket should help a little bit. Nice. That heat blanket's pretty cool. Does a good job. Protected everything. Now you can get it wet or not. We didn't get it wet in this case, but it's 
perfect. Make life easy. We went ahead and made a little setup over here with the dryer that we can get it brazed in over here. We already test fit everything with the ball valves, making sure that the shutoffs, the pressure ports are on the inside so that way you can isolate it, recover the charge from here, swap out the dryer. Gave ourselves plenty of room here in case later you need to cut it so that way you can sweat in a new dryer and have a little bit of space. So Will's gonna get that sweat together and then uh, we're gonna come over here and pull this compressor out of here because it's ready to come out right. now. We're just gonna give the condenser a quick blast right now. We have our cup right there. Pull it down a little bit where we can see it. feel any oil coming out of the condenser either and usually again on a tube and fin condenser you would feel the oil gargling in there um, so uh, we're gonna tip over that compressor and pour the oil out and just find out but all signs lead to the fact that that compressor should still have its oil in it and now we're ready so we got a spoiling catch-all with an HH core which is the high wax content removal as you get a burnout the insulation the plastic coating on the windings of the compressor can start floating through the system and the HH cores are specifically designed to remove that wax. They have a much more fine uh, particulate removal, I guess is the right way to say it. Um, so that definitely helps the systems. I used to think HH meant high acid, but it actually doesn't. Uh, the normal Sporlin catch-all core has amazing acid removal as it stands. So this right here is really just for the wax removal. It's not really a lack of oil problem because there's oil in there. Now, whether or not that's the 1.6 liters, I don't know about that. There's still oil left in it, but that's certainly enough oil for this compressor to run. I was looking, thinking that it was like the other one where it was gonna be completely out of oil, and that's not the case. So, I'm wondering what the cause of death was here. We're gonna have to cut this guy open to figure it out. Um, plugged up air filters would cause low suction pressure, low compressor cooling, high ambient temperatures, I guess could cause this compressor to bake. We also know that this guy was more than likely, it's a piston, so more than likely it was flooding back, flooding with liquid, but liquid flooding on this typically would, well, it could have been just one time. We could have just blown the compressor apart inside. It's hard to say, we'll have to open it up. But lack of oil, I don't think that's really the problem. Um, if I had to guess, those cups are what? Probably 16 ounce cups. So that one's about half full, that one's three quarters full, that one's a third full. I mean, there's quite a bit of oil in there. And I know there's still gonna be more in the compressor. We went to lunch, the unit's been running, and we had it in a vacuum. So we just shut off the vacuum pump, moved it over to here. Um, we're currently changing the contactor. Now we field modified this unit and we're adding a low pressure control, which it didn't have before. And we're putting a time delay relay for short cycle protection. So we're changing the contactor, wiring in the relay, and then we're gonna weigh in the charge and hopefully start it up here in just a few minutes. We've got just about four pounds of gas in it. It takes 5.8 pounds or five pounds, eight ounces. So we gotta turn it on now. We're getting probed up. Um, I'm gonna have to jump this out because it's satisfied, so I'm gonna jump it out real quick. All right, our system is running. We have it all jumped out. We are currently waiting for this time delay that we installed, the short cycle delay. It's currently holding voltage out. It's a 180 second timer. So when that closes, our compressor should turn on and we'll be able to finish charging it. We were only able to get right about four pounds of gas in it. it takes five pounds, eight ounces. So we're just waiting for that delay, then we're probing up so we can check out the rest of the system. The other thing I thought about too is we want to make sure we're going to check these other two contactors, see what kind of shape those are in too. Being that it wasn't an oil failure with the compressor, it starts to make me wonder if it was just a contactor failure. We pulled these other ones. I mean, other than that one being a little darker, but we looked up into the points, it doesn't look bad. So we don't really see anything wrong with the other contactors. So we're going to let those go, put the covers back on, and then we're ready to fully evaluate everything. Now we just got the air probes in the unit, so we're going to turn it back All on. Right, this timer wasn't working. This was one that I had in my truck. I don't think it was used, but who knows. So we, I sent someone to go get that. We pulled it out of the picture for now, but we'll put it back in. So that's just an anti-short cycle timer. So if the low pressure cuts off, that way it doesn't just 
run on and off based on the low pressure control. If this opens, that timer starts running. It you know slows down the short cycling basically. Um, so in the meantime, I've got everything running and we're checking the charge. Okay. So if we come over here, this is a fixed orifice metering device that has a piston. Uh, you can see that we're running about five degrees superheat. I believe that's what we're calling for based on the indoor ambient conditions, about five degrees. Okay. So first stage looks to be pretty good. Second stage looks to be about the same. Six degrees superheat, somewhere in there, okay? Third stage, however, has really high superheat, okay? Now we weighed in the factory charge, but what we didn't account for yet is that massively oversized dryer that has a lot more internal volume, okay? So we need to go ahead and adjust the charge. Now we're gonna do it based off of superheat. So we're gonna get us to about six degrees superheat by adding charge carefully. This is a micro channel system. So a little bit goes a long way with this guy. So you can see we're basically right at 5.8 pounds, um, adding just a little bit at a time, metering it in through the ball valve and giving it plenty of time to stabilize because it's really easy to overcharge a micro channel. Really, really easy. So I'm gonna keep letting that thing run for a bit, adding charge a little bit until we get that number dialed in a little bit more. I added a couple ounces, actually about eight, nine ounces, something like that. I got my super heat to about six degrees. That's about as close as I wanna go. Um, let's go through it. So first stage, we're actually running low super heat. Now keep in mind, I have it jumped out, so we have a low load in the building. So that is gonna affect things, okay? But it's kind of coming back up. Uh, sub cooling about six degrees. Second stage. Give it a second. It's running right around five degrees superheat, 4.64, right in there. Kind of doing the same thing because of the low load. Eight degrees sub cooling, nine degrees sub cooling. Third stage, give it a second. Right at about six degrees superheat, nine degrees sub cooling. So that's pretty good. Everything's running like it should be. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and scroll on over. Uh, outdoor air is about 83 degrees. Um, return and supply. So we have a really high temp split. Now this unit guaranteed has undersized duct work. It's a typical package unit at a restaurant. So that's gonna equate to why we have such a high temp differential there. So this thing's kind of doing everything it can. Um, now, last thing I wanna check is, let's come on over here, go to our probes, probe manager. So if we scroll right on down here, high pressure three, high pressure four. Notice there's only three compressors. What I did was I put a pressure probe on each side of the liquid line filter dryer so we can see pressure drop, okay? So 340, 340.1 basically, because it's 340.7 and 343. So we have about a two PSI pressure drop across that liquid line filter dryer, okay? So we know that for future reference. Um, we can also do temp checks across it, but that's that's good to know, okay? Uh, we see anything three to five and we start questioning whether or not we need to change it. And that's why I put ball valves here. Because this thing is uh, was a burn, we put in the HH core, we put these ball valves on so it'd be easy to change this filter dryer after the fact without having to recover the entire charge, okay? So this unit is back and running. I still need to cut open the compressor to see what failed inside of it. I'm kind of leaning towards maybe it was a contactor failure because um, the initial thing was the burnt contactor, but it could have damage too though from the plugged up filter dryers, right? So who knows? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and take my jumper off and like I said, take all my probes off and start cleaning up. I got another tech coming back with the delay timer and then we'll get that put on there and then that's it. We'll give the keys to the customer and tell them to keep an eye on it. Coming up to this one, I thought that we were gonna run into the situation where we ran out of oil again, like in the last uh, package unit compressor replacement. When I got it back to the shop, I cut it open and I was like, dude, it was bone dry. Like, oh my gosh. So that package unit, um, they still haven't approved me to dig into that further on the other one. But regardless, when I came up to this one, we had, again, plugged up filters, okay? And uh, the initial service call was back in September and the replacement just happened the first, I think November 1st, okay? So it'd been two months. It took them a while to approve that quote and the air filters had already plugged up again. So in the very first clip, I changed the air filters because they were plugged. Second clip, two months later, they were plugged again. That's what we're talking about with this sand. It's just insane. So it, it'll just blow my mind that those air filters can plug up that fast in that short period of time. 
Now, uh, we went through, and again, we changed the compressor. Uh, you guys saw in the beginning how I isolated the, the bad compressor so that way the unit could work in the meantime. We came back out, had a couple guys with me. They changed the compressor. I was more or less doing paperwork and supervising kind of as the day went on. So I really didn't do a whole lot of work, just drilled the evaporator and let them do pretty much everything. But um, the... Uh, the compressor, you know, we were a little worried that maybe we were going to have the oil problem. So that's why I drilled the, the, the suction line header going back to the compressor. Still nothing. We blew it out with nitrogen, blew the condenser out with nitrogen. No problem. Then we poured the oil out. Now, I never measured it, but there was a lot of oil in that thing. So it wasn't a lack of oil. I'm really thinking, I haven't cut the compressor open yet, but I'm really thinking that the problem was, was just that failed contactor. I think the contactor probably got sand in it or something burn a leg, burnt the wire, who knows, loose connection, something like that. And I'm pretty sure it just single phase the compressor and just damaged it internally. It could have been, you know, something weird with liquid refrigerant coming back because we know what the plug filters uh, on these units. These are like budget model Linux units. So they only have a freeze stat from the factory and a high pressure control, no low pressure controls, which we solved that problem on the third stage by adding the low pressure control and the delay timer. So that way, you're not getting the on off of the low pressure control, but we basically did everything that we could to make sure the system was operating properly. I like the idea of putting in the ball valves when I can. We put the massively oversized filter dryer. We obviously had to compensate by adding refrigerant to the system for that. Okay. And I showed, and that's so important to understand, we weighed in the factory charge and then it was still had really high superheating was low on charge. And that was because we have a large capacity filter dryer. Um, I believe the original filter dryer was an eight cubic inch and we went to a 30 cubic inch filter dryer. So it's huge, right? So big, big difference. So I had to add like eight or nine ounces of refrigerant, I think is what it was. So we did that systems back up and running and everything was good. It's been about, I don't know, three, four days since we did that compressor replacement, uh, probably two days actually, cause today's the fourth. I think we did it on the first, um, or maybe we did it on Halloween. I don't remember. I can't remember. No, I think we did it on the first. So anyways, um, but yeah, everything's back up and running. We did the best we could. Uh, I do have the compressor, so I will be, uh, at some point autopsy in that. I'm sure I'll make a video about that. Um, but yeah, that's it. I really appreciate you making it to the end of the video as usual. Any questions, comments, feel free to shoot me an email to hvacrvideos at gmail.com, or you can put questions and comments down in the comments for YouTube. Uh, if you haven't already, check out my website. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, hvacrvideos.com. Um, hats, beanies, sweatshirts, t-shirts, stickers, all of that stuff. Great way to help support the channel. But to be honest with you, the easiest way to support the channel is literally just watch the videos from beginning to end. That is the easiest way, okay? Um, if you check out the website, you can also go to Patreon, PayPal, YouTube channel memberships. Those are all ways to donate to the channel, essentially. Um, there's links in the show notes of the video. Last but not least, you can go to truetechtools.com. If you use my offer code big picture, one word, uh, you get an 8% discount at checkout, right? So you purchase whatever items you want at checkout, put in my offer code on almost all the items they sell on their website, you would get an 8% discount. There's a few things that it doesn't apply to, but for the most part, you'll get the 8% discount. When you use that discount code, big picture again, one word, I get a small commission from that too. It doesn't cost you anything extra, just helps out the channel. So that's another great way to support the channel. Again, I really appreciate you. Thank you so very much, and uh, we will catch you on the next one. All right, we are going to do an audio sync. All right, all right, all right, so, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, so, all right, all right, all right, well, it, all right, all right. coke nose going on again it's because my nose hairs rub my mustache hairs and it just freaking drives me nuts and i always joke around and say it's coke nose